supposed to take the makers off the table, but it's oh, all it's too late now. Might as well take. I a did sip. not see that coming. Oh my it's god! It's the lore. It's the mystique of it all. We're still doing it. We haven't been cut off yet. Oh shit! Good job, buddy. Nice job, Daniel. Good job. Keep that rod bent. Keep that rod bent. I mean, people used to get so scared of them, they had to shoot them. Yeah, that's true. But because you literally can't stop thinking about it, you know, you haven't, you can't scratch the itch enough. Do you guys want to listen to an hour podcast with this? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely do. We won't make people do that anymore. <laughs> we could do this. Or we could do this. Okay, that's enough of that. One year into the podcast and we're Woo-hoo. getting all slap happy over here. You got your host, Dan from Musky Fool and Josh. From Musky Fool. Josh. <laughs> also known as Bam Bam. The Great Bamboozler. The Great Bamboozler. One year. One year of podcasts. Oh, boy. It went fast, didn't it? Yeah, it did. We, uh, we did 20-ish. Yeah. One a little bit uh, bi-weekly in bursts. Yeah. We stuck to our guns. When the fishing was bad, we did more podcasts. When the fishing was good, there weren't a lot of podcasts. This is kind of the trend of 2023. Yeah, you guys can't fault us for that, right? So for your sake, you hope the fishing's bad this year, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also another year of wondering what is going to happen in Wisconsin with stocking for muskies. It's been touch and go for a while. Uh no one really knows what happened, um, what didn't happen, what the future holds. Places like where I live and fish on the Madison chain are at risk of not getting stocked fish, which is what keeps and makes and keeps those fisheries alive. So we're going to talk about that today. Madison chain specifically, we're going to highlight the role of stocking, the role of stocking in the musky world, the conversation about stocking, what's ahead, and where we might need some help from everybody to make sure some of these places stay good fisheries in the short term. We're going to hit that broader ecological concerns about the lake, kind of the state of the Madison chain and a whole lot more. But first, but first, we got a few uh, fun topics to talk about. First and foremost, um, just a reminder for everybody, we are doing a hosted School of Fishing, the Musky School, presented by the School of Fishing. This is going to be hosted by Musky Fool. Yours truly. Josh will be there. I will be there. Nick will be there. Hunter will be there. Gabe may be there. We'll see how many folks sign up. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be four days of fishing in northern Wisconsin. Fully paid for. Lodging, food, everything's included in the price. Guides every single day. Two anglers to one guide. Lake boats, river boats, jet boats, rafts. You're going to have a shot to do a little bit of everything in the world record home of muskies, the capital of muskies, the home of the world record muskie, whether you believe it or not. The epicenter. The epicenter, no doubt about it. Where they, where they are supposed to be, where they are happy, where they are... Muskies aren't happy, fuck that. Where they are supposed to be. Yeah. Muskie paradise, but it's probably more like the seventh layer of Dante's Inferno. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a super fun school. We'd love to have you guys. So uh, check it out on the website. There's more information there. And then uh, there's a website as well. And we got a link to that yep. on our events page. So check it out. And we're not Sign staying up. at an Airbnb because we're not allowed to do that anymore. <laughs> um, we're staying at a lodge that is hosted by Treelands. So everybody will be on their best behavior, right? Yes. Right, right Josh? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Should uh, you be the one looking in the mirror? Uh, you know, recent history would suggest I am the problem. I think that there was a mirror that literally... I just think Nick and I need better access to the bathroom. <laughs> it just wasn't well lit. It wasn't, there wasn't good signage. Uh, what else we got? Uh, you know, just a shout out to support your local Muskies Inc. chapter. We've done that before. We're going to talk about how good Muskies Inc. chapters can be and what they can be used for. Uh, they're definitely in need of young people coming out, joining the club, joining the board, getting involved. Can't just let all those old guys decide everything for us. Otherwise, we know how that will go. <laughs> but dump bump uh, So join, join your local chapter. Um, what else? What else? What else? Uh, do you follow Pete Main on social media? A little bit. I dip in and out every now and then. You're not like a religious follower of his stories? No, 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 no. Have you been made aware of um, 
his non-fishing related content. Yes, I have been made aware of this. Now, this is not uh, a point where we want to express any political opinions, but I just want to say that I kind <laughs> of love it. <laughs> I kind of love that <laughs> Pete just says what he thinks, posts what he thinks. I think recently there was a, a meme about the darkness being pulled back and reality slipping in, a little conspiracy theorist. You get some good stuff. So if you don't know who Pete Main is, legend in the muskie world, been catching muskies longer than I've been alive. He's also uh, got some hot takes on the current state of things, the mm-hmm. universe, reality, you name it. And I'm a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fun. A uh, little touch of housekeeping. Calendars are open, folks. Boats are getting ready. Muskie fools are getting ready for the 2024 season. Chomping at the bit. Get you in the boat. We talked about the school fishing. That's going to be uh, eight spots available. Seven uh, paid. One is going to be given away uh, for free to entry. More to come on that. If you want info on the school Ooh. fishing, Muskie School, presented by Muskie Fool, go check that out on our website. But if you can't make that work, we got a whole summer of activities. September and October and even November are kind of, they're pretty booked. Um, but that's okay. The fishing is awesome all year round. Especially in summer. Who doesn't want to come fishing in summer for muskies? I think the rule of thumb is always that it's harder and that we should go in fall. That's when the bite is best. And I don't agree with that at all. No. Oh, don't you want to wear your flippy floppies and hang out in the sun flippy, all day? Flippy floppies? Top water? Top water, dude. Fast water? Fast water, dude. Suntan, suntans, dude. All day, you get to fish all day, all day, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, who wouldn't want some of that? So, I want some of that. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna be doing. You can, you can bass fish another season. Yeah, come out. I can't wait. Nick wants you to get in the boat, sling some top water bugs at fast rapids, and catch muskies. So N- Nick's a good dude too. He's super fun to fish with. Yeah, and you'll learn a lot. Yeah, pity vote. We're, we're, we're appealing to pity right now. Get, out, get in the boat with us. We're nice people. <laughs> All those other assholes make you fish hard. We let you do whatever you want. Yeah. Josh gives foot massages. Too bad he's not guiding anymore. Yeah, that's true. You're going to miss out on those foot massages. Yeah. It was always how you got the tips after a long day. Those are the stories I would hear. Yeah, just the tips. No fish, but he gave me a good foot massage. <laughs> <laughs> Those musky fool guys, they don't really do much for their lunch program, but their post fishing program is strong. Oh, it's off the charts. Yeah, extra for back massage, but foot massages are included. Yeah. Uh, on a brighter note, there was a 59 and a half inch musky caught last year, and I haven't heard anybody just uh, talk about that. Did you? Are you aware? The massages were in a bright note. <laughs> the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> The, yeah, I haven't either, Dan. It was we in were the Muskie Zinc magazine. That's where I learned about it. We were trying to watch, uh, you know, see if there was a video about it online, Nothing. social media. It's pretty hush hush. That's a monster. It was logged in the Muskalon, the Musk, whatever the freaking, th- the lunge log for Muskie Zinc. It was logged in there. 59 and a half inch on the Ottawa River. I don't remember the fellow's name. That's a half inch shy of five feet, bro. Probably trolling, we think. We don't know. I can't remember. It says it in there. Somebody can fact check it. Dang. My guess is would be trolling. What a monster. 59 and a half inches. Can't fathom it. Almost off the bump board. What do you do with that? Uh, I've had dreams of that size fish. I don't think I've ever seen a fish that size. 59 and a half inches. I have definitely not seen a 59 and a half incher. Should I say it one more time? 59 and a half inches. Yes. Where do we find photos and videos? Did anyone make a video of this fish? Someone had to have made some type of... I have not seen of... a photo. Really? I have not seen a photo, no. But someone has something somewhere. You don't not take a picture of that fish. Nothing. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So we'll be going to the Ottawa River as soon as possible, uh, along with all of you, to catch the fish that doesn't exist anymore. No, it was put back. It was apparently caught and released. Good. So, yeah, those are our updates from the field from Josh and Dan. And uh, we're going to get into the major topic today, folks, the Madison chain, the state of the Madison chain of lakes. As far as muskies go, we're going to talk about stocking, Capital Cities Muskies, Inc., which is a big player. Um, but first, where did it all begin? So 
Madison is uh, not a native musky lake. Let's be clear. It's in southern Wisconsin, uh, not a native musky lake. The Yahara River uh, is basically what forms these chain lakes. You have Mendota, Monona, Wabisa, Kaganza, and also Wingra, and a little couple upper mud and mud lake. But the main ones are Mendota, Monona, Wabisa, Kaganza. Whoa, tongue twister. A little tongue twister. Um the Yahara River flows through all of them, all the way down to the Rock River. And muskies are not native here. But about 50 years ago, 47 to be exact, Muskies, Inc., uh, the Capital Cities Muskies, Inc. chapter, and the DNR decided to stock muskies. And it overall was really successful. Uh, it, it slowly turned into a really solid game fish fishery. Um, the size class grew and grew and grew. Um, there was good like recapture every year they experimented um i think because it was a non-native fishery they were able to experiment with several different strains of muskies tiger muskies leech lake muskies great lakes i don't think great lakes ever made it in there wisconsin strain um there was once uh for a little while there's a, a study being done on leech lake muskies and the growth rate of those fish that live in madison alongside wisconsin strain or upper chippewa upper wisconsin river muskies um, the results of that have not been published. We will share them once we get them. But that was ongoing. So a lot going on. Overall, it was CCMI that had the biggest role, Capital Cities, Muskies, Inc., in getting fish in the system. And it's turned out to be quite quite the project. Mm-hmm. We're at a point almost 50 years later where there's se- consecutively for the last several years, 53 is being caught, 53 on a fly caught in 2022, 53 caught, 53 and three quarters caught in the PMTT in 2023. Uh, it's a pretty good fishery. But I think it's a, also, as we're going to discuss, uh, a little bit of the canary in the coal mine when it comes to what the future might hold for muskies in Wisconsin specifically. And um, part of that is stocking. So I guess to start, how is... Compare this a little bit differently, you know, to how you think about, um, like, how do you think about a place like the Madison Chain, Josh, knowing where you live and fish the most is almost the opposite of that in terms of native, the native headwaters of muskie. Mm -hmm. How do those, do you feel differently about them when you're fishing on them? I feel very entitled and privileged. Um, Which one? (laughs) Happy to be. I'm happy to be up in Eau Claire, but yeah, yeah the, the Madison chain, uh, it feels very commercialized and urban and very accessible, overpressured, mm-hmm. um, all of these things. All compliments. Compliments from Josh. Yeah. <laughs> I, so you love it. <laughs> I haven't spent too terribly much time on them, but I know there's really big fish to be had there. There's a lot of really enthusiastic diehard anglers in this area too and the chapter has rich history and and it's they got a they got a good start on it 47 years ago and they've done a great job over the years but in in the last three three or so years not so good of a job no, and the trend no. is not looking so good Mm-mm. and whenever i hear that i'm, I'm always an advocate for muskies and, the, and their health and safety so i would love to yeah help out I think that I hope others can help out. I think when we should talk about that, like what, what has happened literally. So how this has gone in the last most recent history is there is a basically a quota, a number of muskies based on the size of the lakes that the DNR says is like the capacity that they'll stock carrying capacity based on a number of fish per acre target that they're looking to hit. In Madison, that's about 2,600 muskies across the three lakes that they stock, Wingra, Monona, and Wabisa. The DNR historically has that, those fish have come out of their budget. Those fish have been reared and stocked from the DNR fish hatcheries. Used to be one down here in Lake Mills, that closed. Then there was some Spooner, Wild Rose. Uh, For the last Three years, we were supposed to get those fish for the Madison chain from the wild rose hatchery. And I think as for various reasons, there, were no, there has been no stocking by the DNR for almost three years. 
And we've had different, you know, different reasons for that. But at the end of the day, the main, I think, theme has started to become established that this might not be the most effective way, or at least the only way we should rely on the future of these fisheries. So just to recap, 2020, there was pretty much no stocking done across the state. You had COVID that shut down a lot of these places. It prevented these fish from being captured, reared, eggs, the whole process that goes into getting a fingerling muskie over a year. Did so not 2020 happen. gets a hall pass. 2020 off, no stocking anywhere. And then you come in and in two of the next three years, you have one year where there was massive disruptions to the fry and the eggs. They had stressed out eggs with high cortisol levels. Some folks believe it's due to a rapid warming in the river where these fish were netted. Um, there was way too many fish in the fike nets. They said these nets, I think they said almost maybe 15 max, and there was upwards of 40 plus fish when they found the nets the next morning due to pot potentially rapid increase in water temp. Totally stressed out. Fish were all fighting. There's too many of them in there. Totally stressed out the egg production. So they really got barely any eggs out of those fish. Weren't even able to meet the bare minimum for stocking in 2021. So in that instance, like the, D, the DNR was unable to stock fish in the Madison chain. Capital Cities had to step in as an independent nonprofit club using its budget to purchase fish. And of course, in those situations when it's super last minute, we don't have many options. You know, you wanted to stock, it's October, and now you're scrambling to find fish. So by no means are 2,600 fish stocked, far less than that. And all of this data is going to be published in the podcast notes, just an FYI, as well as publicly available right on the DNR's website. You can go and see every single water body and what's been stocked in it on a nice table. So we'll post the link to that, but go check it out for the Madison chain or really anywhere you fish in the Wisconsin area. But, so bringing it back, the DNR doesn't stock fish because of basically sum it up to bad egg production. The, uh, Cap City says to step in. And we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. A muskie, a fingerling muskie costs $17. Yeah. So Which, we're talking like... Forty to fifty thousand dollars here to get twenty six hundred muskies. Yes. Yep. And then it happens again, and again we find out pretty late. And this time it was something to do with a virus that got in, and it impacted these fish. We don't know exactly how. Was it through the minnows? Was it? We don't know how. The DNR doesn't know how. Apparently the hatcheries don't know how. But again, no muskies available to stock. So. You know, this is by no means meant to get on a podium and shit talk the DNR. Not what we're trying to do, whatever. Don't want it to be construed as that. But the facts suggest ineffectiveness. And I think what that's highlighted is how clubs have had to step in and supplant these things. So this year, Cap City's Muskies, Inc. is budgeting the full amount. We are nowhere near close to hitting our goal, but the full amount to stock the entire chain with muskies. Hopefully, that's just a... Worst case scenario, the DNR stocks 2600 and we don't have to spend money. We can use that money on all sorts of other things like research and water improvement and all of the other higher order problems that there are. Stocking is like the basic, mm -hmm. it's the foundation. So we'll see. But I think wanted to wanted to take a minute to talk about that and, and bring people's attention to it because it's important. It's obviously close to our home. But I think it, at least the way Josh and I feel, is it highlights a... Um, a broader, broader topic of conversation, which is this whole idea of stocking and this whole idea of stocking fish, specifically muskies, which I think we kind of just, I don't know, I'd be curious in your thoughts, but mine are, in, I'm on the fence about how I feel about it. It, it. This whole idea that it's kind of a man-made fishery, despite us hiding behind, uh, well, it's the native, it, it used to be here, <laughs> you know, it's a, Mm -hmm. But in Madison, not really the case at all. Yeah, it was never naturally reproducing no. in Madison. Mm -mm. So th there is no alternative. But you're saying, would you rather see funds being used to just keep stocking every year and putting a Band-Aid on a problem or actually address the, the problem, which is natural reproduction and put resources towards that? And the argument, you know, a, someone a, 
who would tell me I'm stupid would tell me I'm stupid because if we would stop stocking muskies, there would be no muskies in the short term, I think. That seems fairly obvious and is, is not something I would disagree with. But yeah, what's, we're just like all okay with this thing that's actually not that great. And in some ways I was thinking about it, it was like, would you rather have, this is super arbitrary, but would you rather have uh, less numbers of muskies in Wisconsin but have it be a natural reproduction wild fishery? You know, not have Madison chains, but know that all of the fish in the Wisconsin River are native and wild and naturally reproducing. It kind of seems like it's something we should at least strive for, and we don't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like, no, 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 no. We want to catch muskies. Stop that. Don't talk. Like, I've, I've heard this at Muskies Inc. meetings. Like, don't bring up natural reproduction. Yeah, that's why they invented live scope. Because <laughs> people want to be able to go out in an afternoon catch and stocked have a fish. Really good chance of catching fabricated fishery yeah. fish. I don't know. It's it seems like uh, well we have had this conversation at least we the fishing industry in other aspects. So draw your attention to the salmon steelhead world. I don't know if anybody saw the recent uh, Patagonia film. I think it's called Salmon. Um, very thought provoking. Good film. Patagonia always puts out high production films, but this and usually about something of a worthwhile cause. Yeah. So worth checking that out. But it um, and it doesn't necessarily dive into this in that video, but the concept of salmon and steelhead has very often come down to stocking and wild fish for stockery or uh, fish hatchery fish, and the um, you know the fact that there was pretty much an entire reliance on stocking for a while, and then the, sh the, the consequences of that were laid bare very quickly, and the entire industry almost had to start changing. And you saw a huge evolution away from stock fish, away from hatcheries, and putting that money. And basically, the argument became the cost to run hatcheries and the cost to deal with the repercussions of what stocked fish do, genetics into the systems, lower survivability because they're not native, all of those things could have been invested in preserving native fish. And that's what they ultimately attempted to do. And I think for the most part, where it's been applied, it's been shown to work. You see native fish return, you see better survivability, you see beautiful, healthy fish populations. Now it takes a lot of work to get there because in other areas you don't see that even though it was attempted, but you have more going on. You have, you know, it's like similar to being like, well, you know, we tried native uh, reproduction doesn't happen in the Madison chain. And it's like, well, yeah, because we have chemicals in the water, boat traffic, shoreline disturbance, no habitat loss. You have all these other factors. So you can't just like flip the switch and say, we're not going to stock. We're just going to let them do their thing and hope it works out. But I don't know. It's kind of back to like, why, why do you think we don't even have the conversation about it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these hatcheries, I think that's like, we've talked about this on previous episodes. They're not, um, they don't have the budget to be the most well-run or operations. They're outdated. I think evidenced by the fact of if you've ever visited one or B by what's just happened in the last three years with muskies. And honestly, even if they are outdated hatcheries, it's still the business of stocking. It's finicky. It's weather dependent. It's seasonal. It's you have birds that you're worrying about. You have viruses in the water. You have all these things that can just ruin it. And it's, it's a lot of money. $17 a fish could be used maybe you need to like adopt a wild muskie for 17 dollars yeah that's a good good question so a little a little bit of a ramble there folks but i think what we're seeing and what we want to bring to everybody's attention is just this relationship there's a conversation to be had around the effectiveness of stocking is that the future we want to hold is it too late are all of these things I'm talking about with native, natural, wild fish, is that a pipe dream that no longer exists and we have to accept reality? It's very possible. I've been told it's pretty much, even in systems like the native rivers in northern Wisconsin, 
the genetics are so far gone from the original state that there's no, there's no getting it back. Cat's out of the bag. Do we want to accept that? Is that true? Or do we want to have the conversation? And then I think more right now is this, this idea of like what's happening with our musky fisheries? We have tournaments coming to Madison. We have some of the best anglers in the world, not myself, others, uh, but one of at least the best anglers in the musky world makes his trade on the Madison Lake, catching tons of fish. And it's not a priority. It's not going to get any more muskies if it's not a priority for the DNR. So what's the role of clubs? You know, we see the clubs come in and have that. Like the CCMI is... They have to figure out a way to get these fish in here. Otherwise, it's like everything they've done over the last 40 years is for nothing. Exactly. Yeah. And it just feels like constantly whack-a-mole. Every year you start over, you know, all the work that you did. So it makes me wonder, is there a better path? I don't think having that conversation right now is going to fix the problem in front of us, which is we need fish in the system. So this is back to our plea at the beginning. Um, join your Muskies Inc. chapter. If you don't have a chapter that you like, join the Cap Cities chapter in Madison. We need, we need muskies. We need muskies to keep making this place sweet. And I think hopefully be an example to the muskie world of how important they are. Um, if, if this is the situation in a non-native urban fishery, what do you think it is in the most native wild places we have left in Wisconsin? I don't know. What, um, there are some other aspects, though, of the Madison chain we wanted to f talk about. And kind of maybe like, instead of the doomsday approach, what's the state of the state when it comes to muskies and some of the lake quality? Because um, there's a lot of things happening that I think people interested in the Madison chain might want to be aware of. Um, so the state of the muskie fishing today, I think it's hard to argue that it's anything less than awesome. And that's, that's what's funny about this conversation is, we could have the best year of fishing ever on the Madison chain this year and stock zero fish. And that might be obvious to some people why that's the case, but that just means we're, the fishing in the next 10 years, when those muskies that we didn't stock, when that comes to pass, it'll get progressively worse. There'll be a decline. And it's how do we avoid that decline? It's really the question. So I don't think we're in a decline right now. If you went out and fished the chain, but it's the what happens in 10 years from now that becomes the problem. Uh, and, and generally throughout the, the board, the fishing is pretty great on the Madison chain. You, have, of course, have issues like Josh talked about. It's pressured. There's jet boats and ski boats and wake boats and all sorts of shit all over the place. But when you boil down the actual fishing, it's pretty good. We definitely have some water quality issues. And I don't know if you... I mean, I, I kind of know because I spend time up there, but you guys don't really see some of those issues up north. Phosphorus, not, PFAS, all that stuff. Not to the level down here. Mm -mm. And we have it bad down here. I think we have some, some main contributors, right? We have a lot of chemicals coming in from the airport. Um, we have most of the chain, Mendota, Monona, has got, you know, metropolitan sewage and all sorts of stuff. You have facilities along the lake. You have... It's a, it's a lake in the middle of a city. Yeah, it's in a very urban setting. A lot think, of humans. I think we all know what that means. But there's some interesting things happening. This is by no means decided, but there's some projects. I think in this day and age in Madison, Madison, of course, leans a little bit more um, liberal than the rest of the state. So when it comes to progressive ideas around some of these sorts of things, that can actually be somewhat of an advantage because they're open-minded. So there's some projects to really rehabilitate and rebuild massive swaths of the shoreline on Lake Monona. The intent is to be, uh, have a better impact on the ecology of the lake. Obviously hesitant to say that because who knows how it will play out, but um, to see some of that stuff come to fruition, you know, thinking about, man, how do we get rid of this mile of shoreline that's rip rap, you know, and how do we return it to its natural state? Those are some of the questions being asked at least, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe provides a little ray of hope for what the future could hold for muskies in Madison or just the lake in Madison. Cause it seems like if, you know, your perspective of it is pretty spot on to what I think the general public views when like, ah, oh, yeah, it's just a, 
it's overpressured, overpopulated. It doesn't really matter at this point. You know, the other line of thought that people get upset about, but no one knows what to do about it, is the lake water quality. You know, you come out to the lake in the middle of July, you got sloppy weeds everywhere, you got big algae blooms, you got dog warnings that they can't swim in it, young children can't swim in it. You got warnings on pretty much every fish not to consume them. It's like under the hood, you're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. None of that sounds good. You don't have fish consumption warnings <laughs> up by you. No. I don't think so. Not yet, at least. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I don't think so either. It's a cesspool of chemicals. And it's, Madison's not unique there. Any urban fishery has that, but it's kind of like, it's back to this whole idea we talked about with stocking. Like, are we really just going to accept that that's where the, it's over? The conversation's over? We just, we stock fish? We're just going to accept that humans are going to live on lakes and then after they live on lakes and more, it's just going to become a kind of a disaster? Pretty much. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't laugh, but it's, it's you, the mean, nature of human beings. Yeah, and there's only so much people can do about it, but I think... Um, being aware of what's going on is the first important part. Mm -hmm. Just when it comes to like, where stocking comes from? You know, where do muskies come from? It's kind of like, mommy and daddy, how was I made? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just come back to like the cost benefit of, uh, of all of this. You know, whether it's stocking or P PFAS or something like that. Um, man, it's expensive as hell to operate these fish hatcheries. And then, like, sometimes they just, like, don't work. Yeah. Like, well, imagine if you were a business and you're like, all right, you get a budget to, you got to hit this. Last year we did $2 million in revenue, and this year it was like, oh, nope, we just didn't work. Zero. I don't know. It's tough for you guys because now your, your club... Your Muskie Zing chapter is now responsible for 100% of whatever stocking you can afford. And it feels and you, like we're just we're just in the trenches while there's like this big picture, you know, like the aliens are coming and we're over here arguing about, you know, yeah. it's today Wednesday. You guys can't even focus on any peripheral yeah. programs or anything like that with your budget. It's all research, going to stocking. Yeah. And there's so many things that could be learned. Water quality, research... Why don't muskies spawn naturally reproduce effectively down here? You know, what could we learn about that that would help us, you know, alleviate or avoid pain on places like the Wisconsin River where they do naturally reproduce? Mm -hmm. No. How far do they travel when we... No, there's just... We, we don't have money. We don't have time. We don't have money. Don't have, it always comes back to that because we're just slinging mud over the stocking. It's all we... when we have to. I mean, I've, I've been in the, the board meetings. I've been in the meetings with the DNR. Like, you have to... No one, myself included, is going to stand up and be like, here's an idea. What if we don't stock anything next year? <laughs> <laughs> We're stuck. Without, without a, a, an off-ramp. I think that's like, what's the off-ramp? Yeah. You can't just stand up and make a bold statement like that and not provide even one solution. Expect, yeah, well, one solution that's... We should just maybe not stock and see what happens. I bet it will work out. Yeah, you can't rely on hope. And I think being realistic of, like, what's the biggest problem in sight is the natural reproduction. What, are you hearing me say the natural reproduction of muskies on the Madison chain is one of them? No. But it's an example. And I think Madison, the Madison chain, it gives us that example because it allows for experimentation. You go start futzing with genetics and fish stocking and all of these variables on native watersheds, you run into problems. We saw this with salmon and steelhead. Native fish right alongside hatchery fish, DNA blending, it, it gets away from you pretty quickly. In Madison, it's contained. All our fish, even though they can escape, they escape downstream into Illinois, into non-native water. They're in non... So you can... I'm not saying do whatever you want, but from a research standpoint, like, there's less constraints. We could learn a lot. What I'm trying to say is we could learn a lot about muskies in this watershed to apply elsewhere. Not a priority right now. 
It's a bummer. That's tough. I don't even know what to say. I think it's also... Um, if we can get stocking stabilized, where at least it's not the main conversation, then we do have the tools to take it to the next step. I mean, we're also s surrounded in Madison by one of the greatest research institutes, one of the greatest research institutes that relates to science and water, the limnology department. You have Stevens Point from a outdoor and natural resources. The, 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 the smart minds are here. We're doing the studies. We looked them up, some of them, before this uh, podcast. Like, uh, we got the Dugan Lab in the summer for, or the Wisconsin Center for Limonology focused on climate change um, and how that impacts inland waters and bodies. They're doing research on that right now. We also have them doing some sustainability and aquaculture initiatives, um, trying to understand how to manage the health of some of these. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff being done, but it's just totally disassociated from the anglers. Um, and it goes back to this, like, it feels like there's a lot of people that care about the same thing that don't know about each other. And together, you know, maybe we could have this conversation about natural reproduction or what did we talk about on the last podcast? Live scope or whatever it may be with the right, you know, scientists and users. And But no, it's just the DNR arguing with fishing clubs. Is this episode going to bridge the gap between these two organizations, do you think? No. No? How's the gap I mean, going to get bridged? You, it's just you and me talking right now, <laughs> and Gabe, and uh, like probably just Gabe listening, so <laughs> no. How's the gap going to get bridged, Josh? I don't know. Bridge the gap. Mm. I mean, I think that's where Madison stands out, is because it, there has to be enough people. You take some random lake in northern Wisconsin, and there's not enough people that know about it, care about it, fish it. It's not close to a university. It's not... Madison has all of that. And I think you kind of have to frame a problem. The, the, what's the problem that we're all aligned against? What are the things we're all on the same team about? You know, as the muskie fishing club, we can't just sit in the corner whining about, we want more muskies, bigger muskies. Most people don't care. The kayakers don't care. The Center for Limonology does not care, probably. You know, the DNR might, it's not, might, might not be their priority. So what, what are, where do we all but fit to, in? But to your point, framing it all up, it's all tied together. So the kayakers might not specifically care about muskies, but they definitely care if there's milf oil everywhere and they care yes. if they can't dip their skin into the water because they'll contract some weird yes. disease. And then pan fishermen might not care about muskies, but they're going to care if there's a sign saying you can't consume any f fish out yes. of this lake and, and that so seems on to be and the, so forth. Like the, 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 the big hairy beast is the thing hiding behind all of that stuff. Mm-hmm which is like, this isn't working that great and we want it to be better. But then you're absolutely right. And like, I think doing a total analysis or a total inventory of all of those issues and where are the commonalities? Because you, you get that when you talk to some of these groups. You're like historically, you know, you're a walleye angler and it's, you know how we feel about walleye angler. But then we talk and we're like, whoa, oh, you're worried of the, the fishing's, I get it. Yeah, we're both aligned. Mm -hmm. They had the weed growth, Has, where's it been? You know, the clarity of the water, the, those issues start to populate up. And then it's like, oh, yeah, we're aligned. But most of the time also it's, you know, nonprofit volunteer organizations. We don't have any powerhouses. You know, like Trout Unlimited, what they did was organize. Mm -hmm. And they have lobbying power with the, with the government, you know. And there's undoubtedly ways into that. Might be via a walleye angler, might be via a trout angler, might be via a bow hunter or a bear hunter, you know, but I think we, yeah, I just, I keep saying it and it sounds a little too idealistic, but I think there's, it's the only path is we're either all together in this or we are all apart in this. And I think the all apart is just more nonsense, you know, nobody knows, nobody's able to kind of stitch it all together. Mm-hmm. But getting us all together is tough. But it can be done. Like I think that's what Trout Unlimited showed. Mm -hmm. I think that's what um, 
for good and bad, right? Like it can be wolves. Like the, that that got a community about. There's also a community fully against it, but you, you got people organized that were not just like the 15 musky anglers who go out on the lake on Monday. I don't know what the future's going to hold, though, Josh. But that's um, that's what's going on in Madison, and we have some ways for everybody to help. We don't want to make this a sales pitch, but we do we do need to get, guilt some folks, ourselves included, into helping out because folks that are going to fish places like this in the next ten to twenty years, they need we need the help now. We need the help right now. So, like I said, join Muskie's Inc. chapter, specifically Capital Cities Muskie's Inc. We have to raise over forty thousand dollars to stock muskies. Every donation counts. Um, we just raised uh, almost a thousand dollars or almost five hundred dollars at the Fly Tires Rendezvous, just a one day event. And that's that helps. All those little things helps. And there's been some awesome organizations that have already donated. Muskie Fool is one of them, but Team Rhino, um, Suic, Lure Company. So you know we we really need to to hit that number because that is the difference between muskies being in the Madison chain in the future and them not. Um, so get involved, reach out, come to some meetings. Uh, we're going to post some info with the podcast. Uh, we have uh, a little PowerPoint. There's been some research. We talked about the stocking history uh, and the history of muskies in the Madison chain. But that's really all I had. I feel like I got to do my Madison chain muskie soapbox. So thanks for humoring me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. What about you? Anything Anything else on the horizon that we need to touch on? Any updated uh, episodes that we're chewing on? We got some in the hopper. We do. They're shoring up a little bit. We got some. Uh, we got some fun guests, kind of along these lines, actually. Yeah. That, uh, we've been in contact with, so hopefully that comes to fruition. If you're out there, Paul, we'd love to have you on the podcast. You're probably not listening, but if you heard us ramble about water quality on this one, we really, really, really need an expert to talk to. So absolutely. If you know any experts, folks, send them our way. We'd love to chat. Because clearly we're. <laughs> <laughs> if you know any experts, hurry, help the podcast. <laughs> it's going south fast, just like the muskies on the Madison chain. Help me. Uh, I think that's everything, folks. We won't hit you too hard, but we appreciate it. Another episode in the books. Spot burn podcast. Thanks, y'all. Over and out. I have brought muskies from outer space and will give them to you at a price. Thank you for listening to the Spot Burn Podcast. Coming to you from the dungeon, this podcast is presented by Musky Fool Fly Fishing Co. We want to thank our awesome sponsors, Cortland Line Company and Stealth Craft Boats. We also want to thank all of you, our listeners, for tuning in, subscribing, sharing, and spreading the good word. If you haven't heard, go check us out at muskyfool.com. Have fun up there on the water, y'all. <laughs>